You all can go ahead and uh, get started here whenever you're ready. Yeah, just a second or two longer. No worries. I'm waiting for the number of participants to magically increase to 150, but <laughs> I don't think it's going to. Okay, so let's get started anyway. So, hello and welcome to the Tadwick 2021 virtual conference. This is session SIM07 on digital extended specimens. And your moderators today are Andrew Bentley and myself, Alex Hardesty. The session will be recorded for later viewing. Uh, you can find notes in a Google Doc. The link is given here and someone please will paste it into the chat. Uh, please go to there and scroll down and add your name as an interested person in this symposium. Uh, thank you for joining us today to explore the potential of digital extended specimens and to hear outcomes of the community global consultation that took place earlier this year. This consultation was coordinated by the Alliance for Biodiversity Knowledge with help from the GBIF Secretariat. We want to say thank you to the representatives of these organisations that supported and assisted the consultation, especially those of you that acted as moderators and those that are speaking today. So on behalf of Andrew and myself, the Alliance for Biodiversity Knowledge, thank, thank you for, for your support. We'll begin with a keynote note talk and I'll uh, tell you more about that in a moment. And then we'll hear four talks coming from the consultation. The four, first of those talks will report on the overall highlights and outcomes of the consultation. The next two talks deal with building a global biodiversity commons network and with preparing the workforce to work with digital extended specimens. Finally, we'll hear a technical talk about moving towards a more transactional way of working with digital extended specimens with an example technical solution to support that. Each of these talks will be 10 minutes with a short time for questions after each one. And then towards the end of the session, we'll have some spare time for questions to all of the speakers and comments and discussion on all aspects. Please use the questions, uh, please ask your questions using the Q&A feature in Hoover. And please also try to use the chat function in Hoover rather than the chat function in Zoom, because then the chat and the questions are recorded and it's much easier for the moderators only to have to look within Hoover for, for chats and questions. The, que the questions will be put to the presenters by a moderator. The chat function is, of course, available for conversing between the attendees, and I remind you to be polite and kind and exclusive, and remember the Tadwick Code of Conduct. Uh, inappropriate use may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. And of course, we're grateful for technical support from the University of Florida conference team. And please bear with us and with them if there are any technical difficulties. We hope that you enjoy the session. OK, now I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker to kick off the session. As an outdoorsy type who enjoys losing himself in wild places, that's his own description, not mine, Michael Webster spent his high school and college years wondering how to make a paying job out of his passion for nature and watching how animals behave. Today, Mike is the Robert G. Engel Professor of Ornithology and Director of the Macaulay Library of Biodiversity Media at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where he researches and teaches about animal communication and behavior, especially among birds. Many of you will know that in 2017, Mike edited and published a book entitled The Extended Specimen, a collection of essays intended to initiate a renaissance in collections-based birds research. The essays highlight the opportunities that come from using existing specimens in new ways and from extending the scope of the specimen concept itself to include other things than biological or geological materials, such as audio, video, photographic recordings, and a wide range of other kinds of data. It's this latter aspect of extending the specimen concept, combined with a notion of representing specimens digitally on the internet as self-standing, trustworthy information objects that is the topic of today's symposium. Mike is keenly aware of the importance of specimens and the kinds of research that they can enable. And today he's going to talk to us about how the digital extended specimen will enable new science and new applications. And this will set the scene for talks that will follow. 
Welcome, Mike, and thank you very much for your talk. Thanks very much. I guess I was on mute. Um, I'm going to get my slides started. Whoops. Okay. So hopefully you can all see that. Um, thanks very much, Alex, for that, uh, that very kind um, and slightly intimidating introduction. I really appreciate it. Thanks to Andy as well for organizing this symposium. Um, all the co-presenters and everybody else has come together today to talk about this idea of the digital extended specimen. So I guess I just wanna start by saying biological collections have been the backbone of research in ecology, evolution, uh, morphology, conservation, taxonomy numerous other fields for, for decades. Um, and that's because these collections are composed of specimens, each one of which captures the phenotype and often also the genotype of a particular individual at a particular place and time. Um, take, for example, these two specimens of the magnificent uh, rifle bird, uh, one male and one female specimen. Um, from these specimens, one can easily determine the differences between rifle birds and other species of birds. You can also assess the morphological differences between the sexes within the species. Um, and moreover, these specimens can be examined in way, other ways to reveal other aspects of the biology of this particular species. So for example, morphological traits can be measured directly from the specimens themselves. Uh, chemical isotopes can be extracted to look at things like diet. Uh, the microstructure of feathers and other traits can be examined microscopically. Um, and DNA can be extracted for genetic analyses. Uh, but these standard specimens, of course, don't capture all dimensions of the individual's phenotype, but fortunately, these other dimensions can be captured using other data and other approaches. So for example, media such as audio and video recordings and also photographs can capture the behavior of individuals. This, this slide here shows a screenshot of a video in the Macaulay Library collection that shows a male rifle bird courting a female. Uh, this video reveals the behavioral interactions between the male and the female during courtship at a particular place and at a particular time. And so in a sense, this video is essentially a media specimen that captures the behavioral phenotype of this population. And I think I forgot to share sound, so I'm going to Reshare here, great sound. Okay, going back to my slides. Okay, and so similarly, audio recordings can capture the acoustic signals of individuals. Um, so these two recordings that I'm showing in this slide capture the advertisement calls of male rifle birds from two different populations. Sorry, Mike, we're, we're yeah. seeing all, um, all your speaker notes and your next slides rather than the main Thank slide. You. Thank you. A, a rookie mistake. Better now? Yeah. OK, great. So this slide, as I was saying, shows audio recordings that they capture the acoustic signals of, the, of this population, um, the male advertisement calls in particular. So the first call shown on the top is what male rifle birds sound like in Queensland. And the second recording on the bottom is what they sound like in Irian Jaya. So what I hope is obvious to you is that they sound different in these two different populations. So this is a phenotypic, a behavioral phenotypic difference between the different populations of this one particular species. Um, so recordings like these, as well as videos and photos can be used to examine variation in acoustic signals and other behavioral traits across populations. 
And so specimens like these, whether media specimens or traditional physical specimens, um, are the basis for much of the important research in, in a whole diversity of different fields. Um, and in recent years, there have been a number of important advances for increasing the research power of these biological specimens. So the first is digitization itself, um, which is creating a fair digital representation of the physical specimen that contains data about it. Um, and this digital representation can be hosted in appropriate databases in the cloud, which makes the specimen far more accessible to researchers. Second, technological advances have made it possible to use specimens in new and more powerful ways. So for example, from this frog specimen, it's possible to get good measurements of external morphological traits, but it's far more challenging to get measurements of internal traits. Uh, but fortunately, new methods in computed tomography or CT scans make it possible to visualize the various layers of internal traits and even internal traits like endoparasites and things like that. Uh, we can also collect samples and associated data that are typically curated apart from the physical specimen itself. So for example, uh, blood and other tissue samples can be collected for genetic and other analyses. Uh, we can also collect photos that capture what the animal looked like in life or audio video recordings that capture its sounds and other behavioral traits. Uh, we might also collect parasite samples from the frog that are sent to an invertebrate collection. And there might be also field notes or photos of the field site associated with the entire collecting event. All of these are useful data and samples in their own right, but they'll be synergistically most powerful if they're tied back to the physical specimen itself. Of course, in some cases, the physical voucher specimen may not exist. Um, for example, blood samples or parasites or recordings may have been collected for individuals that were not themselves collected, collected as physical vouchers. And this is because there are sometimes ethical, legal, or logistic limitations on how many vouchers can be collected. But while voucher data are the gold standard for research, samples and data um, lacking a voucher are still valuable and can be used for a lot of different kinds of research. And in fact, these samples and data can be linked to other specimens that were collected during the same collecting event. So this then is what we mean by the digital extended specimen. It's the entire linked network of specimens and data and other derivatives that are all associated with each other. Um, others in the symposium will be discussing details of how we can make the digital extended specimen concept a reality. Um, but what I want to do in this talk is focus on why we should bother to do so. And what I will do is argue that developing a network of digital extended specimens creates opportunities and facilitates new areas of research and also enables whole new applications. So I'm Okay, yeah, sorry, I, my screen froze there for a minute. And the first point I wanna make is that the digital extended specimen greatly increases data quality and reliability. Um, in particular, tying the derivative data and samples back to a physical voucher specimen provides that important reference point that is critically important to many applications and research uses. Uh, while it is not necessarily even uh, feasible to collect a voucher for every individual from which we collect a DNA sample or a recording or a parasite sample, we should be collecting vouchers for at least some of them because that is the gold standard for research. Um, but there is a lot of emerging evidence that this gold standard is often not achieved. For example, Buckner et al. Uh, recently showed that of the 1,300 highly um, high quality genome assemblies from vertebrate taxa that were, are available at GenBank as of January 2020, only 11% of them referenced a voucher specimen in a published paper or appropriate database. This is, of course, concerning because proper analysis and interpretation of the genomic data requires proper taxonomic identification, particularly if and when a taxonomic revision is needed. And of course, proper taxonomic identification is also central to numerous other analyses and applications ranging from biodiversity monitoring to population restoration. 
making the digital extended specimen a reality would be a gigantic leap forward to ensuring taxonomic reliability of data used for these applications. The second major benefit of a digital extended specimen is that they allow for novel and powerful analyses. Um, in, pet, in particular, they allow for co-analysis of different specimens and data that are associated with each other. And I wanna give a few different examples to illustrate my point here. So the first example is research from the lab of Carl Hopkins on the evolution of signals in weekly electric fish. Um, Arnegard et al. studied a group of very closely related species from the tributaries of a single river drainage in Gabon. Uh, they used physical specimens to show that many of the species are nearly identical morphologically. And isotopic analyses derived from tissue samples argued against strong dietary differences between the species as well. So these results together strongly suggested that speciation in the species flock is not being driven by ecological differentiation. But then they analyzed recordings of the electric organ discharges from the same species and showed that these species differ very strongly in their weekly electric signals that they produce. Um, this supports the hypothesis that sexual selection is leading to divergence in mating signals, which then leads to reproductive isolation. Um, examination of the electric organs and specimens in turn can reveal the morphological changes that are leading to signal diversification. Um, and then the same research group also uncovered some interesting cases of cryptic species in this group, that is coexisting sympatric species that were morphologically nearly identical, but differed in their electric signals. Let's skip that example. Uh, switching to birds, a PhD student in my lab, Dan Baldessari, used feather samples collected from individual redback fairy wrens across the range of the species in Australia. And they found morphological decline in plumage coloration, which is shown in red in this graph with um, higher values on the y-axis being more red and lower values being more orange. Um, so Dan found a morphological decline in this plumage coloration, which was consistent with two subspecies that had been described in part based on plumage color. Dan then used DNA extracted from tissue samples from the same individuals to show that a there is also a strong genetic decline that differentiates the two subspecies from each other. And these gray, um, these gray lines show individual genetic markers and the, the black line is the combined um, genetic decline. Interestingly, in this case, though, the plumage cline and the genetic cline were offset from each other by a couple of hundred kilometers, demonstrating that sexual plumage traits are introgressing from one subspecies into the genomic background of the other. And just one last example, the digital extended specimen network will make it possible to co-analyze different specimens that are related to each other. For example, one could co-analyze specimens of ectoparasites and also specimens of the vertebrate hosts from which they were collected to explore host switching and range expansion by parasites and other pathogens, including diseases that might jump to humans. Um, similar co-analyses of associated specimens can be used to understand the evolution of mutualisms, um, such as between plants and their animal pollinators. So all of these various examples that I've run through are intended to illustrate just one general but very important point, um, and that is the detailed co-analysis of associated samples and specimens allows us to address novel and important questions in a number of different areas. A few years ago, this sort of research would not have been possible at all, and today it is very difficult at best. Uh, but a robust digital extended specimen network will make this sort of research possible moving forward. I would now like to discuss research that is enabled by linking digital extended specimens to other data sets, for example, remote sensing data that describe the biotic and abiotic environment. Um, so for example, Belize et al. were interested in under understanding the factors leading to population declines of an endangered lepidopteran. And they used historical occurrence data from museum collections, all collected over several decades, and combined those data with land use data and ecological niche modeling. And their analysis showed that historical changes in the patterns of human land use drove population declines, providing valuable information that can be used for appropriate management and restoration efforts. So similarly, a recent study by Bascompti et al. used information on pollination networks 
and distribution modeling based on occurrence data for 244 plant species to show that some pollination networks are far more susceptible to extinction than others. Um, and with, in particular, Mediterranean population network, our pollination networks being particularly at risk. So these sorts of approaches can also be used to better understand biotic responses to ongoing climate change. A uh, pretty cool recent study by Weeks et al. used a 40 year series of bird specimens collected at a single location in Chicago, uh, combined with NASA remote sensing surface temperature uh, data to show that warming temperatures are driving reductions in body size, but also increases in wing length across a set of 52 different bird species. And of course, similar studies of other collections and other data sets are beginning to show morphological and also phenological change in response to ongoing climate change. Um, in my lab, PhD student Maddie Orr is using data from an extensive series of black-throated blue warbler specimens at the Smithsonian Institution and also associated tissue samples that she's using to extract DNA, combined with remote sensing data to look for signatures of local adaptation, both morphological and genomic, across the entire range of the species. Um, her studies are ongoing, but already um, she's, uh, they're yielding some intriguing results and we're seeing areas of a strong genomic differentiation between populations. And where she's now looking to see if those map on to remote sensing um, data on environment. Um, there are also important practical applications for these, um, for these approaches, such as identifying sources of ivory from poached elephants. So Wasser et al. Um, have been using genetic analyses from samples of elephant dung to develop a genomic map across the ranges of both savanna and forest elephants. And then they examined genetic markers from seized ivory shipments um, and map those onto this genoscape, this genetic map they've made from the dung samples to show that all three, um, the three different seized ivory shipments had all origin originated from the exact same region of Africa. Um, and this led to the identification and actually the arrest of a key smuggler. Um, moreover, information, this sort of information can be combined with landscape use data to identify factors that contribute to poaching risk for these animals. Okay, so in closing, I just want to demonstrate one last point, and that is that a robust digital extended specimen network will also allow for specimens to be used and analyzed in new ways, um, ways that we're only barely beginning to understand now. And, and we'll tie those analyses and derivatives back to the original voucher specimens. So we've already, um, we're already seeing new uses with respect to CT scans, as I mentioned, earlier measurements that can be taken directly from digital scans, uh, powerful new uses for DNA and isotopes extracted from specimens. An important point here is that the data referenced by a digital extended specimen can be accessed and manipulated increasingly by computers as well as by humans and out without needing to access the physical specimen itself and also not needing to bring all the data back to one single place to process it. Increasingly in the future, these sorts of analyses will be performed in a distributed fashion using data in harmonized forms. Um, in addition, there are new and, and powerful methods are being developed constantly. One exciting example that um, I'm, I find very interesting is the use of machine learning algorithms, for example, to identify and classify organisms or traits. So, um, so for example, audio and video recordings in the Macaulay Library collection are being used to train machine learning algorithms to detect birds and other organisms, both visually and acoustically. So in this screenshot, which is from a video, the upper panel is the video of birds at a bird feeder and trained algorithms are drawing boxes around the birds in the video and identifying them to species. And then the bottom panel shows a similar machine learning results for the audio uh, recording associated with this video. So the algorithm is recognizing and identifying vocalization of the birds in the video. So approaches like these are making it possible to survey and monitor critical habitats with camera traps and autonomous recorders. With these sorts of machine learning algorithms, it's now possible to analyze hundreds or even thousands of hours of recordings um, to detect the calls of various species. And the, that of course makes it possible to determine which species are present, 
um, versus absent in, in these areas, and also to address other questions, for example, about questions about annual and daily activity cycles. So although, just to reemphasize a point I made earlier, although not all of the recordings used for these training, uh, training these algorithms need to be vouchered, it's important that at least some of them are so that recordings can be reclassified when taxonomy changes, in particular for cryptic species that do not differ much in morphology, but do differ behaviorally. Uh, for example, the calls they produce. So most of the studies I've highlighted, highlighted today have been done without a true network of digital extended specimens or with a rudimentary network at best. Most of these studies were done by brute force and with considerable effort to bring the needed data, specimens, and samples together. A proper digital extended specimen network would make these sorts of research projects and applications far, far easier. So the key point here is that so much more science of this sort could be done and at much larger scales with a well-developed DES network. The remaining talks in this symposium are aimed at understanding how we might make this concept a reality. And with that, I'd like to thank many colleagues who discussed these topics with me and again, the organizers of the symposium. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, that's a stimulating talk. Um, Andy, are there any any questions in the, in um, the chat? We have a we have Thank a single you. question in the Q and A for you, Mike. Um, from from Jurek Pullen, he says you seem to suggest that the extended specimen does not yet exist. However, in the conference, many projects have shared existing links between specimens their related taxonomies, occurrences, etc. What is different between these existing links and the yet to be introduced digital extended specimen? That's a, a great question, an important question. So I, I was trying to touch on that in the last couple of slides. It's not that the extended specimen network or the digital extended specimen concept doesn't exist at all. Um, there are linkages that are made between um, samples and associated derivatives, associated um, voucher specimens. Um, but the, the, the extent to which this is being done and practiced is uh, very spotty and inconsistent. And um, the, the technological innovations and also workforce innovations needed to do this at scale do not yet exist. Um, just as one example, when I came to the Macaulay Library here as director about 12 years ago, we had several thousand uh, uh, bird recordings in our collection, audio recordings in our collection, which in the notes field said specimen collected. And in maybe five of those cases, I could actually, I actually had a, a, a catalog number for that specimen, knew where, where, which collection and where it existed. For all of the others, we didn't know. It's just, it hasn't been part of the workforce training or the technology to do this at scale. So I hope that answers the question. I don't see any more questions. Happy to answer any that pop up. Thanks a lot, Mike. That was a okay. stimulating presentation. Great, thank you. Can I, may I ask one? It's done. Of course. Hi, Mike. I, I did. You, you just gave a cool example though. What's different about what you do now compared to when you first got there so that it doesn't just say specimen and whatever in the notes field? So now we're trying to exchange, um, you know, with the, the, the museums, we, we, well, we're doing two things. One is we've done a lot of detective work to suss out where some of those specimens exist and add the, the specimen numbers, the collection and specimen numbers to our own database. And then uh, what we're trying to do and have done at a small scale is do co-collecting events where birds are recorded and specimens are collected and the data are collected at the, at the point of the collecting event itself so that all the information is tied together from, from the get-go. Um, I do think that there are, again, technological um, advances that could make this whole process a lot faster and easier. 
So, Mike, there's another question that's just been asked in the in the chat in Zoom um, by Austin Mast. He says, why is this not the digital extended occurrence, given that sometimes specimens are involved and sometimes not? That seems to be the concept, conceptual bedrock here. Yeah, of course, we the the distinction between occurrence data and and physical specimens is a, is a real one. I think that that is um, that's a, a valid and good point. Um, to me, the the distinction, um, the important point here is that the the sorry, I lost my train of thought, but you know, the, it could be called, I guess, the digital occurrence, uh, extended occurrence. But the important point is that all of these things are tied together in a collecting event. And so most of them or many of them will be tied to a voucher. But in a collecting event, if we go out and we, we record a bunch of birds, we collect blood samples from a bunch of birds, we collect ectoparasites from some, but we only collect um, vouchers of some of those birds, then we have um, vouchers for the specimens, for the parasites and recordings that, of those birds that were collected. But we have indirect vouchers, or what's been termed in the literature, indirect vouchers for the others to where the, the physical specimen wasn't actually collected. I sometimes call those population vouchers. So individuals from the same population, the same place and time that were collected, that can help ground truth some of the other recordings. Um, but there is an important distinction to be made there, I agree. And there's another question that's come through from Cynthia Parr, who says, can you com comment on how best to share and document the code and scripts for linkages associated with these extended specimens and the scalable analysis you are talking about? And I think uh, some of this will probably be answered by Nelson's presentation later on. Right. Um, the, that my answer to that, Cindy, is no, I can't comment on that. Um, that <laughs> I, that's not my area of expertise, but I do know that uh, the um, talks that are coming later will be able to do a better job. And I think there's another question here by Richard Levy, which is going to be answered possibly by Anna's talk, which is, are there any efforts in the works to address the lack of training on creating digital extended specimens at scale, workshops, for example, also, where does current GBIF infrastructure fall short on supporting this type of data network? Um, so answering the first question first, stay tuned for our Anna's talk. Um, I think workforce training is critically important to all of this, um, as much as technological um, innovation. Um, and uh, what was the second question, Andy? Um, where, does, where does current GBIF infrastructure fall short on supporting this type of data network? Yeah, and I and I, I think Joe Miller. I I, I can't um, comment on where GBIF infrastructure falls short at this point, but that I think it's important to analyze GBIF and other you know other entities that are involved in this game to understand where where are we falling short and where do we need to develop. Not wanting to speak to Joe for Joe directly, but one of the innovations that that GBIF has just put in place is their new clustering tool. Mm -hmm. which allows you to cluster like like organisms based on on critical data so um, that's a, a good step in the right direction right i can probably add to that as well and say that you know it's important to understand that the digital extended specimen concept uh, is, is is what we might call an active concept as opposed to, to a passive concept and uh, individuals whether they're researchers or curators or, or other kinds of specialists, will be able to interact with the, the, the content of a digital extended specimen uh, in a much more, um, let me say, um, man manipulative or programmatic way than is currently possible just by retrieving data from databases. I could jump in here quickly too. Uh, so this this whole discussion has uh, kind of uh, helped GBIF think about our data models. And in order to aggregate these digital extended specimens, we need to be able to appropriately model the data that it's coming in. So we have started to to relook at uh, how we are uh, modeling data coming to GBIF and improving that so that we will be in the position to uh, better manage digital extended specimen linkages uh, as they come in, in 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 large volume. So there's another question that's just come in from David Shorthouse. What proportion of the world's specimens can be extended? 
How do we ensure that specimens that will never be extended remain valuable in the eyes of administrators? Now, that's an interesting question. Um, my gut answer is all of them can be extended. Um, uh, and, and we need to continually argue for the value of our specimens, whether they're extended or not. But associating data with specimens and associating different specimens with each other is, in theory, applicable to any specimen, as far as I can see. And there are surely extensions that we do not even understand yet. There are things that we can possibly do with our specimens in the future that, may, um, that we, we may not even understand. That's right. And if you think about, you know, the extensions include derivatives of the specimens. So that would include CT scans, photos, measurements, anything like that. Those could all be linked back to the specimen itself. Okay, it looks, I think we might be out of time. So I just want to thank everybody again. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yes, and I want to say thank you to you again, Mike, for, for giving this uh, stimulating talk. Uh, I think it's been very helpful to, 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 to try and understand the, uh, what is enabled in terms of uh, uh, potential new science, potential new ap applications by this exciting concept. Cool, thank you. Okay, so shall we move on to um, uh, the second talk in this session? Uh, a little bit ahead of schedule, but not, not to worry too much. Uh, so Libby Elwood is going to talk to us uh, uh, to introduce the, the global community consultation that took place this year and tell us about some of the highlights of it and, and, it, and its outcomes. Over to you, Libby. Great. Thanks so much. Um, thanks to Alex and Andy for organizing this. And um, that was a great way to kick us off, Mike. I'm going to make sure that I have my presentation and notes all lined up here. All right. Can someone confirm that you're seeing the right view of us? We, we do. We, we do see it. Great. Thanks so much. All right. So um, as Alex um, introduced this, I'll be focusing on the highlights and outcomes of a global community consultation that took place this year. There were two phases to it. And so I will walk us through, um, yeah, some of the highlights and outcomes of that. And I'll just also mention here that um, while we have a, um, a fairly robust author list there, this doesn't include nearly all of the moderators and participants and everybody who was involved with the consultation. So a huge thank you to everybody who played um, a role of any kind in this consultation. Of course, it took a whole community to, to pull this together. So uh, for the last several years, there have been growing conversations about the exciting possibilities of digital representations on the internet of billions of specimens, as, as Mike shared um, some great examples of. Um, in Europe, DISCO has been developing the digital specimen concept, and in the US, we find BCON's extended specimen concept, and they, they're comparable. Both seek to connect and align all, inform all information related to a specimen. As both of these concepts grew and gained interest in their respective geographies, it became clear that uniting them would be an important step for the community and to make progress on the goals and objectives of these concepts. It's also worth mentioning that um, this came up in the uh, after the last talk as well, that GBIF has um, been bringing together potentially related biodiversity records by matching similar entries in individual fields across different data sets mediated at GBIF. And the new clustering algorithm gives us a taste of the possibilities of a fully integrated biodiversity data in the future. There are um, complementary but differing visions of the digital extended specimen model and the biodiversity and biodiversity informatics communities have been discussing several critical areas with technical, financial, social governance and professional implications as they relate to next steps in converging the digital and extended specimen concepts and implementation. This is critical in order to achieve collective consensus on the vision model and way forward from where we are today. It's also important that the entire global community is engaged and has access to the latest technical and social developments and thinking. 
And at last year's Tadwood conference, hopefully some of you guys um, were there as well, there was discussion about building a fully integrated digital data infrastructure. And many of us signed a letter of intent demonstrating interest in working together on a global specification and interoperability for the DES. The Alliance for Biodiversity Knowledge and GBF's community forum provided structure and a platform for continued and deeper discussions on several topics of interest in the DES. The consultation included two phases. Each phase kicked off with a webinar presenting the discussion topics that were open in the online forum, an introduction to the forum itself and how to use it, and opportunities for participants to ask questions. And if you navigate to the consultation pages on the discourse forum, you could find recordings of these, um, of these webinars, which might help um, provide some additional perspective for some of this as well. The overarching goals of the consultation were to expand participation in the process, build support for further collaboration, identify important driving use cases, identify significant challenges and obstacles, and to develop a comprehensive roadmap towards achieving the vision. So I'm going to spend um, the next series of, of slides summarizing the discussions that happened on the forum related to each of these topics. Um, this was no easy task. Each topic produced rich and vibrant discussions. So condensing them down into a sentence or two really doesn't do them justice. So I hope that these summaries serve um, more as a way to whet your, whet your appetite to go into the forum and to explore the full discussions with all of their nuanced detail and uh, links out to related resources. Topic one was making fair data for specimens accessible. And contributions to this topic iterated the need to assign persistent identifiers and that institutions and those responsible for assigning identifiers must maintain the link between a digital specimen and the corresponding physical specimen. This, of course, while meeting regulatory, ethical, and other sensitivity obligations. Topic two focused on extending, enriching, and integrating data. There seems to be no shortage of data that can be integrated. However, a roadblock to accomplishing this is insufficient publishing mechanisms. A more transactional mechanism is needed to support areas of the work being uh, beyond just that the technical, beyond just the technical. Supporting social aspects of the work, for example, will allow the connections, annotations, and attributions of the work to be made more visible in real time. Topic three was annotating specimens and other data. Uh, clearly, annotations are an important extension of a physical specimen and have the potential to play a role in developing funding streams for implementation. However, as are so many extensions of the physical specimen, it is critical that there is trust in the annotations completed by both humans and machines if they are to be used at all. And attributing the work done was topic four. When uncovered, the fascinating yet often hidden histories beyond collections, including information about the collector and collection locality, can aid in data discovery, as well as advancing the research prospects of the institutions and individuals. Involving institutions and individuals, along with publishers and discussions about the attributions, will ensure fair application and um, use of the derived metrics. Topic five was analyzing and mining specimen data for novel applications. Um, this graphic can compete with um, Mike's sonograms that actually um, played interesting uh, songs, but I did want to include at least some of the representation of other types of specimen related information aside from the physical specimen. So here's a, here's a sonogram and I have some of the other types of um, extended data as well in my other images. In this topic of um, analyzing and mining specimen data, discussion on ways that the digital extended specimen is poised to contribute to timely research using data from infrastructures that may be supplying data in a variety of ways. This also ties into developing workforce training and resources for those collecting, managing, and using biodiversity data. So phase one went really well. It was very um, productive and fruitful and also exposed um, a host of additional topics as well as deeper dives um, on more technical discussions within the original topics that we decided to use some additional airtime. And thus phase two was started this past summer. So as with phase one, phase two uh, kicked off with a webinar uh, that, that laid the groundwork for the whole, um, for the whole discussion. And topic six uh, was robust access points and data infrastructure alignment. 
future infrastructure development will pull from technical innovation over the last couple of decades that will help from that will help inform infrastructure creation and maintenance, as well as relevant standards, alignments with principles and other technical considerations um, to ensure the most efficient possible representation of a DES ecosystem. Topic seven, persistent identifier schemes come with a variety of considerations ranging from costs to implementation challenges. Further, PIDs for people and organizations was discussed. Uh, topic eight was meeting legal, regulatory, ethical, and sensitive data obligations and a plethora of sensitivities around collections, including legal, ethical, data collecting and sustainability, um, uh, sensitivities exist and must be considered in a DES framework. And these discussions um, uh, were pretty rich and diverse as well. Workforce capacity development and inclusivity. Uh, Anna Monfels will be speaking on this later in the session, so I'll leave the details of this to her expert assessment. But in summary, um, we, we need to include awareness that when we address capacity development and inclusivity, particularly for individuals and institutions in fields that intersect with the fields of biodiversity, that it, that it does include the um, awareness and just raising the fact that we're out here, this is what we're doing, and, and this is how we can be working together on this. Um, that goes along with the more, um, the more often discussed um, areas of diversity and inclusivity. Topic 10, transactional mechanisms and provenance, uh, additions, changes, annotations, and augmentations of data resources can be tracked with a transactional data publishing model. And I believe this is a topic that Nelson Rios will expand upon shortly. Partnerships, um, this is a really critical part to efficiently and effectively find solutions to biodiversity issues. And um, I'll leave some of these details to Deb Paul and Joe Miller, who have given this quite a lot of thought and we'll be speaking more on this in a second. So there is a lot of work still to be done before implementation of the digital extended specimen and the consultation highlighted many of those directions, provided creative and interesting perspectives and continues to serve as a resource for the people and institutions at the forefront of this work. Um, when we digest it all, we see some a few steps that came from several of the topics, things like continuing to learn from the biodiversity community and provide training and education about the digital extended specimen, connecting and engaging with existing and new stakeholders, others in adjacent fields and people at every corner of the digital extended specimen. And we need to experiment and prototype using use cases, past research and development, and anticipated future needs as guides to an implemented digital extended specimen. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, there were um, dozens, if not hundreds of people uh, involved with the consultation. So thank you to everybody who supported, contributed, organized, and uh, took part in the consultations. And while the consultation period is, is no longer active, these conversations are, and we welcome your insights and perspectives um, and, and hope that you will join in these discussions because they really are enriched by the different communities that we engage with. So um, please, um, please continue to, to talk about all of this. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Libby. Um, that was a whistle stop tour through what was a, actually a very uh, <laughs> light, lengthy set of uh, uh, consultation discussions over many, many months. Uh, I think you did a very good job there of presenting uh, the main highlights. Um, if anybody's got any questions uh, they want to uh, ask to Libby, we have a few moments. Uh, so please put your questions in the Q&A channel. Um, Deb Paul uh, already pasted uh, links to the two phases of the consultations on the GBIF platform in, into the chat. Uh, you just need to scroll back up a bit in, in Hover. Um, I see a question has come in here. Hang on. Um, so this is from Sarah Davidson. How will you identify use cases and also a funding model? It's two questions in one, she says. 
at least, if, if not more. Um, yeah, thanks, Sarah. I that that's a great question. I right now we are uh, and through the consultation, several use cases and funding models were identified. So there are some that um, came out of the consultation process as well as discussions and conversations surrounding it um, in meetings that have happened. So um, we. It's not necessarily that we are picking some top use cases that will shape the whole thing. Although, of course, when it comes to publishing about this and um, you know even some of these types of presentations that we have, we do usually pull from um, maybe a small number of use cases. So if you have some in mind, same with funding models, we are all ears and, and open to your thoughts. Um, but we are really open to community um, uh, ideas and perspectives on on what use cases and funding models will will help will help to shape this. But like I say, those are are just kind of the things we point to, and and that will help us inform what this looks like. But it really will be um, dynamic and inclusive of hopefully, um, you know, an, an unlimited almost number of use cases. And with funding models, um, uh, I think each of the various branches of the DES. Um, thinking about technical and, and social and, and research base, et cetera, might have um, slightly different funding models that they're turning to. And it could range from very small scale local types of funding that might fund something at an institution or at a national level, but then that could feed into the larger model um, or the larger um, digital extended specimen uh, implementation. So I think we're kind of going small, going big um, and, and open to considerations uh, across the board. Okay, thank you, Libby. Um, there's another question appeared uh, from David Shorthouse. Um, he asks, um, as specimens become more and more extended, how do we measure progress? This model is very different than newly digitizing specimens where we can count objects. That's a great question, and I'll certainly open it up to all the speakers um, in this symposium. And I think with any of this, it, it does it is difficult to count um, things, right? Like what is the thing that that we're counting? And I think that um, when it comes to funding, when it comes to um, uh, demonstrating success or progress, that those are some of the metrics that we need. Um, I think though that the infrastructure itself and the, the partners within the infrastructure are gonna be a big part of this. If you think about um, GBIF, for example, and the algorithm that, they're, that they've developed to um, link many um, uh, different types of data, that, that those are steps in this direction that we can turn to and say, this is progress. This is um, um, getting us closer to that model, but it might not be a numeric thing. It might not say, um, uh, to a question that was asked during Mike's session, you know, how many specimens might not be ex extendable or um, um, able to be part of this model? It's kind of related to that because ideally, uh, I think, you know, most, if not all things, could be part of this and linking them. Um, it might, you might not be able to say a million things are linked to a million other things, but you could certainly say that. Um, these data are out there, it is possible to search for them in a single place and that they can be linked in your search. So I, um, that's, that's why I would in, interpret that. Um, although, like I say, I'm, I'm open to other, the interpretations of that question um, from others here. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, there's another question uh, coming uh, come in from Gil Nelson. Uh, can you comment on how this massive amount of information that has been collated by the consultation uh, will be distilled into specific tasks to tackle? Gil with a doozy. Uh, <laughs> well, um, so we are, there are a couple um, groups that are working on publishing um, ideas about the digital extended specimen models and, and various takes on it, be it um, kind of some of what was discussed now in, in big broader terms, as well as some of the more technical aspects and ideas, um, at least in a conceptual way for implementation. So please, um, those in the audience, keep your eyes out for um, some publications related to that. And we hope that this also sparks um, interest from other groups as well who are maybe considering this in new and different ways and can um, let their ideas be known um, potentially in, in publication form or um, you know even over social media and 
blog posts and and discussions of um, that might be happening there as well. So um, I would say that um, as far as actually distilling it down to next steps, um, you know, we are um, taking what we saw in the consultation and yeah, distilling it into these kind of bite-sized pieces. And depending on what the community really um, gets behind, that will also help to drive it. What there's um, interest for and, and potentially some funding for, I think when it comes down to implementation and I'm um, thinking about this in the shorter, in, the, in a short-term way, not just publications over the next few months, but maybe thinking about it over the next few years, um, it will likely come down to also um, funding and where there's real interest in moving things forward. Okay, thank you, Libby. And maybe Joe will have something to say about this in the next talk as well. Yeah, uh, so, so thank you for your talk and for answering the questions. And I think we'll actually move on to the next talk now, um, which is a, um, a joint presentation, uh, first by Deb, Paul, and, and then with, with Joe uh, coming in towards the end of it on building a global, open, extensible biodiversity commons network. So over to you, Deb and Joe. Greetings, everyone. Is all good on your end? It is, yes. All right. Yeah. So um, in this talk, we would like to uh, focus on recognizing what's needed uh, for the digital specimen and the network that that specimen object or occurrence exists in uh, and whose needs it serves. Our focus in this talk centers around what we've learned so far about partnerships and collaborations uh, to realize a biodiversity commons network. We're not starting from scratch with this effort to envision a digital specimen. Uh, we are all involved in some networks or multiple networks. When you see this slide, what networks do you think of? And is that network sufficient? for the goals uh, that you have as a collection manager or a taxonomist, an ecologist or an administrator. Um, if it is, yay, we need to hear from you and understand how we can link these networks together. And if not, we could also be informed by what you uh, let us know is missing. Moving towards this extended specimen and how do we get there? And so in these two visions, uh, one thing you can clearly see here is going to be the importance of identifiers for all different pieces uh, related to a particular physical specimen. And we have so much data all the time. That's great. We need it to address health, climate change, food security, clean water. But there's more types of data that we need uh, to interlink to address uh, our most needful scientific questions. But for example, where are the humans in these visions? So. We need identifiers, but that's not all. And this start is about a particular part of envisioning uh, a biodiversity commons network. To do this, we need your input on what these partnerships and collaborations uh, could look like and how to connect them and to get to the research we wanna be able to do. So, one thing we're going to need to do is set priorities. And going back to the Global Biodiversity Informatics Conference, or GBIC, in 2018, uh, they asked these questions, uh, what do we want to be able to do with such uh, a vision? And as Alex Hardesty has pointed out, uh, for the people who are going to build the technical infrastructure to do this, give us the user interfaces that we need and the access to the data that we need, um, they have to know what it is we want to be able to do. Uh, and here in the slide, you can see uh, from the taxonomists uh, empowering them to enable them to bring their expertise in a, in a robust way to what we know about uh, the taxonomic and nomenclatural information, uh, to policy use, uh, to questions that are uh, more ephemeral at different levels of, uh, does this data uh, fit my research use case? So to think about setting these goals, uh, there's some interesting benefits that may or may not be obvious, obvious at first. Uh, so we've been talking about the data, but you noticed I mentioned the people. So not only do we have these uh, data that are in different places that we need to be able to link to do what we wanna do, um, we also have a sort of expertise silos. 
And this paper is a really cool way on the graph on the right there. Those are not specimens, if some of you may have thought that. Uh, they are people. Well, I guess that's a kind of specimen. Um, but they are networks of researchers uh, in, with different disciplines. And if the colors don't overlap, their work doesn't overlap. Uh, and as you can see, these are bat researchers. And these are papers studied between 1950 and, and 2019. But you can see here the power of shared goals has uh, many benefits to overcome social issues, as well as uh, integrate uh, knowledge integration which we all desire. And speaking of that, uh, another way to look at this is to follow up on Mike's use of the iceberg analogy and, and, and use it again to get at uh, this research showing that explicit knowledge, this sort of data in rows and columns that we are used to thinking about is the, the surface data that we can see and understand. Um, but the knowledge that we've all gained by what we do, by our experiences, uh, what we've had the chance to master, those are the things that are under the water. Those are tacit. And the only ways we can get at that and get at that information and benefit from it is to connect people. So moving toward this common vision, uh, there is at least, uh, of course, there are more. Three questions we did hear and do hear, some of which you've just raised today. Uh, what's different about a digital specimen? And at least I'd say it's, it's making progress. We've, we're already making progress with identifiers, but it's making more progress in how we manage them, how we mint them, how we understand our role in taking care of them and using them, whether we're publishing information as a taxonomist or whether we're in a museum as a collection manager or whether we're building the infrastructure. The other uh, related question is, what do I do in my local sphere to ensure I can be a part uh, of this future envisioned uh, biodiversity commons network. And then the topic again comes up uh, about shared data curation. And we just heard this example and saw in the chat, uh, for example, the work of Nikki Nicholson to take advantage of the fact that when we aggregate, we can do cool things with algorithms to help us understand uh, things about our data, like finding duplicates that would be much harder to do by a single individual as well as uh, taking the data that's organized taxonomically and ordering it by people instead and empowering all of us on the planet to get involved. So the technical implementation along with the uh, um, flattening the access to the information means we can highlight um, the work the individual, the work the museums do to care for those specimens and the science that facilitates. Uh, for more about why this interdisciplinary work is important and at different levels, you can see uh, Symposium 14 on Monday with Erica Kremel, Holly Little, and Talia Karim giving us a great model for looking at how to uh, facilitate the sharing of tacit knowledge uh, across a community, as well as the panel discussion on interdisciplinary collaboration on Tuesday. Inside the, um, the console, the humanities world jumped in, which was very exciting. Uh, Martha Fleming gave us some wonderful examples of which this is one. So this hidden histories of environmental science takes a, an interdisciplinary collaboration approach to study environmental science of the past and how it was done, which often uh, in the way it was done, there were racial, social injustices as well as exclusion. And they want to understand those so that they can design uh, future environmental science to be done in a way that uh, that doesn't happen, of course. And here we can see an opportunity. We get richer data out of the result uh, in those new models, as well as at addressing access and benefit sharing. As part of this work, they published a great report. It's long, it's really good. And this is just a tiny piece for you. They built a collaboration finder, a tool to help collaborators find each other in their efforts to do this hidden histories work. And look at the question they asked, similar to ours. Who else needs to be in on this conversation? Look at the breadth. It's quite astonishing. It may give us um, some ideas. And what do these partnerships look like? It's clear from the consultation and from prior experiences. It's not just about the big players with the big names and the acronyms that we become familiar with. It's about the individuals and the small groups as well being empowered to participate and bring what they know 
their expertise, all that stuff under the water I pointed to, um, to our, our world because it enriches what we're able to do with the examples I just gave uh, a few slides back. Right? And to do this, then we also need people whose job it is uh, to connect community at various levels. Again, the examples that I've been giving. And this, there's a great example in the open, science, uh, open source uh, software community. You can read more about it in this blog post. But effectively, these people have the, the effect of democratizing access to knowledge and power and helping us build community structures that um, everyone can uh, take part in. So keeping all of those things in mind, um, how are you thinking about your network now? Uh, and what can you share with us about it to uh, help envision this biodiversity commons network that empowers us sharing uh, these specimen information in a new way. Next steps briefly, a white paper to summarize findings and get at some of that underwater information and go on as Libby pointed out to develop some shared roadmaps and uh, communal infrastructure. And that is now Joe's turn to take us up a level uh, to the level of the Alliance for Biodiversity Knowledge and what's next to there. Joe? Thank you very much, Deb. And as Deb mentioned, um, I would like to take it to the, uh, there have been a couple of references to the, to the Alliance for Biodiversity Knowledge. And I just want to explain that a little bit in its um, organization and application to this consultation. So the DES consultation has been run under the uh, umbrella of the Alliance, uh, Alliance for Biodiversity Knowledge, which is allianceforbio.org, if you want to uh, put that in your search engine. Uh, and it has been a very light touch for the Alliance. This is because the collections community works very well together uh, and making it together and it's made very good progress on this very difficult topic. And as Deb mentioned, the Alliance came out of the recommendations, recommendations from GBIC2 in 2018 with a goal to align investments in biodiversity informatics to support science and society. Uh, and I, I think you can see from the first few talks in this session that that's really what this uh, council is trying to do is to support science and society through biodiversity informatics. A major goal of the Alliance is to deliver strategically valuable products. And this has been brought up, I'm happy to hear several times by Deb and by uh, Libby as well. We really need to deliver roadmaps as outcomes of these consultations. Uh, this is really important because we need to go to our respective funders, usually national governments, and present a shared vision of this community and a pathway to get there. If we can really do that, uh, that is going to be a much more convincing proposition because we do need money uh, to attain these goals. So due to the uh, interest from the collections community, uh, most of the Alliance proto projects have been uh, from the collections community and their data, such as the digital extended specimen, Catalog of Life uh, and Bicycle, which I hope you uh, caught our symposium earlier today. Uh, this is good uh, as, and is part of the visions, uh, but the, the intention of GBIC2 and the Alliance is to reach beyond collections. And we are now developing within the Alliance uh, propositions for 2022, 2022 and how we'll do that. So we'll expand this conversation also into the governance structure. Uh, this uh, conversation hasn't been delayed, uh, but we do have, have that on the agenda for next year. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, uh, our calendar for 2022 is forming now. Um, one of these non-collections-based uh, events will be uh, in February, unknown dates yet, but we have we will schedule a workshop on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Some of you may know that last year we at GBF, we funded a study on the analysis of the biodiversity needs in the post-2020 framework. Uh, this work is now completed. And with the upcoming COP in China, this workshop will focus on how biodiversity data can best be used in this process. You know, even though we didn't really discuss this during the consultation directly, this I certainly think was an underlying proposition throughout the consultation. Uh, we all love biodiversity, and but there's, you know, the, the urgency and the need to use our data uh, for these real world uh, problems that face us today. Uh, this is an opportunity to use the results of the digital extended specimen and see how we can use that to affect um, real progress in the post-2020 framework. Uh, in the second quarter of 2022, uh, we will hold GBIC-3, uh, co-hosted by LifeWatch, LifeWatch Eric. This is kind of a, we have 
thoughts for two dual roles with this. Uh, as I mentioned, our bicycle uh, project in Europe, we have a, a, to deliver a network graph, which is basically a product of, of the grant, um, which will is basically an update of community knowledge that is needed for the bicycle project to be successful. And we want to share that with the community and then use that as a springboard to have a, a, a discussion on the uh, uh, governance of the Alliance. Uh, we still have a lot of planning to do on this. And of course, uh, any kind of governance discussion, uh, discussion requires broad uh, participation. As I mentioned in the last slide, we want to expand our consultations to deliver uh, beyond uh, collections into thematic consultations uh, focused on societal needs. So we do hope to have a uh, more thematic uh, community-based consultation later in 2022 as well. Next and last slide, please. So, so most Alliance activities have so far been in the upper right-hand corner, upper right-hand uh, circle, I guess, you know, these collections-based uh, uh, consultations. Uh, and these are, these are important, uh, but as I mentioned, the Alliance's mandate reaches further out to proactively engage with uh, engaging our data, data in policy in other communities. We propose, propose to do that next year in the, the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework consultation and other thematic consultations throughout the year. Uh, but really the, the key message for this part of the talk is that for the next year, we really need to make sure that these individual activities really serve the larger strategy and goals of our community and of the Alliance. So it's not just to make the digital extended specimen, it's to make this uh, community of knowledge to be used in the best possible way to gather and, and, and uh, attain our, our collective goals to, to further our science and to support policy. So and in order to do that, uh, we need to have a discussion in the GBIC-3 uh, framework about the, uh, the governance of the Alliance and how, as, as Deb mentioned, uh, do sm small groups and individuals are joining and participate in this initiative. Thank you very much. One more slide, which is our thank you slide. Thanks, everybody. OK, thank you, Deb and Paul. Are there any questions for, for Deb and Paul? <laughs> we can come back to it in the uh, uh, time that we have at the end. Uh, I don't see anything appearing in the Q&A channel at the moment. Uh, so we'll move straight on to, to the next talk, uh, which is by Anna Monfils, who's going to talk to us about um, uh, developing the, the capacity of the workforce uh, to work with digital extended specimens. So Anna, over to you. And we can see All your right. slides. Yes, we can see your slides. Oh, and can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Then we're at a win right now. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Andy, for you guys' work to pull this all together. Um, I'm coming in here talking a little bit about workforce, having heard a lot of really exciting things over the last couple of days about the future of collections and the extended specimen. So as we look to the future of natural history collections and global integration of biodiversity data, we are ultimately going to be reliant on a diverse workforce with the skills necessary to build, grow, and support the data tools and resources of the digital extended specimen. So the future DES data curators will be charged with maintaining resources created through the DES, which will require skills and resources beyond what is currently available to most natural history collection staff. So here are several papers that have addressed what some of those emerging skills might be. So training of the DES data curator will need to include skills and content from data science, biological informatics, and computational science. But the DES data curator will also need to be proficient in new and evolving skills for 21st century collecting, including generating the born digital data and linked data that define the extended specimen. And alongside these new and emerging training needs, we will need to continue training in foundational skills in organismal biology and taxonomy. So this represents an expansion rather than a shift in the skills and concepts we expect out of biodiversity curators. And we are going to, as a community, need to be very creative and intentional in providing the professional development opportunities that facilitate a biodiversity literate and a data literate workforce. 
In training the workforce to support the DES, we have an opportunity to broaden our community and ensure that through the expansion of the biodiversity data, the workforce landscape itself is diverse, equitable, inclusive, accessible, and global. A fully implemented DES will provide training that encapsulates capacity building, skills development, unifying protocols, and best practices guidance and cutting edge technology that also creates inclusive, equitable, accessible systems, workflows, and communities that meet the needs of the individual groups that we involve on a global scale. So there have been two US reports, the Biodiversity Collection Next Report that came out in 2019, and the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Report in 2020. And they have both articulated a shared vision of the future of biological collections. Both reports support the actualization of the extended specimen and specifically highlight the importance of workforce development. A priority in both reports was to address training broadly to include the full community from the current workforce to the next generation of cyber collection managers, to the data end users and the engaged local, regional, national and international communities. Looking at this, that definitely speaks to training current workforce and continuing education, as well as training the next generation of cyber collection managers, which includes looking at opportunities for career development. It includes engaging new end users in novel uses of biodiversity data, and that means thinking at the level of K through 12, all the way through to the research community, and all the possible extensions of that in terms of collaboration. It also includes the engaged general public. And diversity, equity, and inclusion need to be at the forefront of all of that. And that can be done by working through societies for significant cultural change, as well as initiatives at all levels from current professionals, emerging professionals to students. The two reports coalesced on some specific recommendations when it came to workforce training. There was definite call for a community needs assessment. As a community, we have several unknowns relative to the current collections workforce and training needs and could benefit from a baseline assessment of collections professionals to define the current job responsibilities, the demographics, education and training, incentives, compensation and benefits, and to include an evaluation of the current employment prospects and opportunities. We also need a defined set of skills and training for the 21st century collections professionals. We need to be proactive and define what those workforce skills would be to support development and implementation of DES. And when we define the skills in context, we want to create the appropriate training opportunities that include scalable modular materials for capacity building, educational materials that develop relevant skills, uniform, uh, uniform protocols across the DES network, and best practice guidance for professionals. Another step is going to be trading for data end users. So this is the data end users that are going to use the data and we need to train those end users in both biodiversity and data science at all levels of formal and informal education from K through 12 through the existing workforce. So this includes engaging the community of science educators, data scientists and biodiversity researchers to develop the inclusive um, accessible and accessible training and education materials. And again, we come to this idea that diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility of the DES and inclusion within the diversity workforce are very important. So as the DES develops and new tools and resources emerge, we need to be intentional and build the tools to be accessible and assure that the access is equitable. This includes best practices to ensure the community provides Providing and accessing data is inclusive and representative of the diverse global community of potential data providers and users. Upfront, we must acknowledge and address issues and historic inequities and colonial practices and provide appropriate attribution for past and future work. And efforts must include creating transparent linkages among data and the humans that create the data and drive the DES. So we have two initiatives emerging from the global collections community. We have the digital specimen and the extended specimen. And both efforts have a shared vision that includes connecting specimens and associated data. 
I have been fortunate to learn more about this in the last year, as there have been several groups meeting to discuss converging the digital and extended specimens and working towards a global specification of data integration. So as part of this process, the Alliance of Biodiversity Knowledge has run a series of consultations. You've heard about them. Um, and during both phase one and two, workforce development came into play. In phase one, workforce training was raised in the discussion on analyzing and mining specimen data for novel applications. So there were several key critical points that came through, but sort of three trends that came through and got some traction was promoting both specimen and digital curation skills, including a reminder to make sure, and I'm using this as a quote from there, fundamental taxonomic work is recognized, valued, attributed, and supported into the future. And that message came through pretty loud. There was also defining more career paths for DES data curators. And I've heard that in several different venues. And then there's also the importance of 21st century collections and born digital data and the impact that can have on facilitating data curation. Since this idea came up in several places within the first consultation, uh, during phase two, we specifically addressed workforce capacity development and inclusivity. Now, again, there are several ideas that were discussed during this, um, but again, some major trends that came through. One big discussion that came through was about the idea of accessibility as awareness. And that kind of segued into really discussing the idea of who knows what data we have in order to be able to use it. But there was also a discussion again about skills and the breadth of skills that would be required to be able to handle the digital extended specimen data. So there was discussion of hard skills like general biological knowledge, broad transdisciplinary knowledge and data management skills as well as the importance, which we, we saw in the talk that we just saw from Deb at all, is the soft skills, such as communication and how you collaborate and facilitate global collaborations. There was also a really interesting section that was discussed on acknowledging multiple systems of knowledge and different ways of knowing, bringing in addition indigenous knowledge, as well as talking about, and there's used, there's a quote about braiding Western and indigenous knowledge together and traditional ecological knowledge. And then there was a discussion about some really successful things such as the data carpentries, where it came in that what was really critical to that was this idea of a community of practice as a critical component of effective data skills training. So this paper came out in the last month and I just don't feel like it could be ignored. <laughs> So this is towards a postgraduate level curriculum for biodiversity informatics, and it came out of GBIF. This came out of a 2015 meeting of the GBIF nodes in Madagascar. And the main objective was to summarize a survey and efforts toward developing a globally offered biodiversity informatics training curriculum. So I was pretty excited when I found this paper because it does address one of the many needs within the workforce training and proposes some ideas. And when distilling them down, they align with a lot of the recommendations coming out of several of these different efforts. Talks about building strategic partnerships to build a biodiversity informatics training curriculum, talking about working with existing educational initiatives and training initiatives, mentions many phenomenal programs that are already in place and effective. Um, it talks about conducting a survey to address training needs definitely speaks to the need for those of us thinking of working on such a survey to be talking to each other. It talks about developing a holistic sequential and modular curriculum with multiple entry points or different ways to kind of enter the watershed and learning about the information with the digital specimens and making sure that it's accessible from professionals entering from different countries with different technologies and levels of support. So out of this, I think of Gil's question about, so what are you gonna do with that? And really we're at a point where we, what is it we need to do next? What efforts are already in place? And what are sort of the small gains, medium gains or long-term gains of thinking about a broader training? So looking at the different initiatives, there's definitely commonalities, but the questions I sort of wanna reach out to the community with is what's missing? Like what isn't or hasn't popped up in any of these discussions? 
What information do we need to identify next steps? So I guess that would be the roadmap that's referring to. Um, what should we prioritize in there? That's always a difficult one because they're short, medium, and long-term goals. And what is the most immediate need? You know, there were some questions asking about how to train to build the DES. Um, how can we be efficient and build our efforts collaboratively and at a global level? What sequence of events needs to be embraced to support the necessary training at all levels? And then I wrote in the key skills workshop on DES that was mentioned in the comments earlier. So I don't know what type of time I have or don't have, or if there are any questions, but um, I'm definitely interested in helping facilitate this conversation further. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, there are two questions in the Q&A. Um, the first one comes from Talia Karim. She says, is there a role here with regards to workforce development and training for the Tadwick Biodiversity Informatics Curriculum Interest Group? I would just, I would think yes. I would think absolutely. And I think the more, maybe even a, a first stop being to identify all of those groups working towards this could be a start, but I would definitely imagine so. Okay, and then the second question is from Ian Engelbrecht in South Africa, who says, should we focus on training biodiversity people in data or data people in biodiversity? They're often quite different types of people. I think that is a really interesting question. Um, I think that we're, we run some serious problems if we don't have both skill sets in an individual. And you see that when someone deals with data without any interest in the biology of the data, they can make assumptions about the data that might not be accurate and vice versa if you don't know what you're doing with the data. I think we've got some so many entry points on trying to create a data literate society. Um, so the question is where the biggest learning gains are going to happen. I think now the better we can build collaboration and effective collaboration, might be the most effective first step. So if we can get the data scientists working with the biodiversity scientists to sort of cross train. There used to be a, pro, um, a program at NSF for that, which is kind of interesting, but something like that would be fascinating to have it where you deliberately train in a discipline you're not familiar with and see what gains would come there. I like the question. So there's a real role for partnerships there then in, in training, I think. Uh, so there's a good tie with the, the, the previous talk and the previous thoughts there, how, how you empower small groups to, to improve training among both data people and biology people. Okay, thank you very much, Anna, for a thought-provoking talk on, on, on training. It's, 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 a, it's a huge topic and, and it needs its own roadmap, I'm sure. Um, let's move on now to uh, the last talk uh, before we uh, have a more open discussion. Uh, and Nelson Rios is going to uh, talk to us about uh, a, a, a possible transactional model to, to realize the digital extended specimen uh, and some technical considerations associated with that. Over, you, over to you, Nelson. Thank you. Okay, just to make sure everybody can see my screen, is it on? We can, yes. Okay. Looks good. All right. All right, so I'm going to talk. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to talk about um, a, a potential model for how we might realize the digital extended specimen. So first, I think I'd like to start just by looking at the, the history of where we are today and how we got here. And, and here, these are examples from uh, fish collection networks. And I know that there are some other technologies that aren't shown on this particular slide, like Biocase and Tapir and, and a few other ones, but the, the story is largely the same, right? If, if we go back into to the 90s, collections started to, to go online, and in this case, it was Fish Gopher. And then around you know, 1998, we, we moved over to the Z3950 protocol. And then you know, ultimately, in the early 2000s, we had Digger and then followed up by what most people are using today, which is the Darwin Core Archive and IPT sharing mechanism. By and large, all of these networks were, large, were, were really focused on sharing data and, and making data available, but there was a, not a lot of, of movement back and forth um, across, across these networks and, and where 
or, or, or linking to, to outside repositories. And, and so we're, we're still basically doing the same thing. Um, and we haven't had any major shifts in, in technology in, in a long time. So it, it might be a good time that we start looking at what alternatives might exist. And if we look at you know, some of the things that exist today, some of the problems, right? And, and you know, so it's, it's real easy to take a data set and publish it via IPT. Um, but one of the problems is that it's also very easy for a data provider to not follow a, a practice of, of maintaining the, the various versions that they publish. So it's really easy for, for data to get published and then it disappear from the internet, right? And that happens quite often. And then you can get things where, you know, you can see in the, in the top of the slide there where, you know, you have two data sets that were published. Um, and you can see that, you know, the only difference between those two data sets is that some metadata was, was published, but yet you have two copies of, of the data set there. So they're just these kind of, you know, oddities that could be resolved and, and make things just more efficient. And, you know, that, that does kind of impact, you know, how we archive and, and, and store the data as well, right? If, if we were to create daily updates of every single archive out there, it starts to, it starts to add up, right? And, 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 you know, at nightly updates, if the data aren't compressed, we could have over 250 terabytes a year of data being, being generated. Um, and so, so, you know, it's, it's these kind of things, and this doesn't include any of the media that, that would also be involved in these, these uh, archives. So um, that's also another consideration is, is, you know, that there's gotta be a more scalable way that we can work with these data sets. You know, there's also right now, and I think this is great, right? So GBIP will, will create a, a, a DOI and, and archive a, a download, but oftentimes the data that you download aren't necessarily what you're going to be publishing on. I know that when I, when I grab data from GBIF, I'm usually oversampling what I need. And, and then I, I come back and, and filter through that to get, you know, the, the actual stuff that will be used in, in a particular study or whatever. And, um, and so, so even though I have this, and, you know, it's great to cite, this is the, the raw data set I downloaded, but then again, there's still yet another citation, which is the final data set that, that's published and, and, and where that is stored and how those two data sets might be linked or what changes may have happened from one to the next. And then kind of hinted at this already is how, how it's easy for, for, you know, versions and other things to disappear off the internet, but same thing with, with repositories themselves. And, and it's not uncommon to find a, a, an older paper that was published and it's pointing to one particular IPT reference and then you try to find that and it's no longer in existence. And, and so those kind of linkages um, create problems. And then one, one other problem that, that's common is, is how data aggregators process the data. And so this was from a, an article that, that looked at some of the differences in the various filtering and processing that the different aggregators do. And, and you know, I've seen this in, in, in my own work looking at data from, you know, iDigBio and, and GBIF and just seeing differences uh, as to how they different, they process fields and the, the kinds of things they do. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of variety and, and, and in some cases, errors that get introduced through, these, through, through the aggregation process. And, and so trying to be able to, to improve upon that um, would be useful. And, and it's not even that it's not necessarily improving upon it, but being able to track it and identify it. And so that when data gets published, we can, we can always track back to exactly how it got there and, and, and be able to look at that, that, that chain of custody for that particular data item, if it will, if you will. And then finally, you know, right now there's there's no real good tools for doing data annotation or, you know, empowering the user to do to do um, high-end searches, right? It's really whatever the data aggregators currently give us. And 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 as far as annotation goes, if I, you know, let's say I landmark a, 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 a image of a fish here or or the you know the moth down at the bottom and, and I want to publish those landmarks and make them attach them to the specimen. There's real no there's no network or or capability for doing that within the current infrastructure right now. And and so you know you get these you know, you could you could argue that you know the, the data get published, right? There might be a link in Zenodo or something like that where we can go and, and grab the results, but there's nothing that brings it right back to the specimen record and, and puts it in a nice um, integrated environment. And the same thing with annotation, you know, dealing with like digitization, you know, if, if we're 
in the example I show here is with, with uh, georeferencing. And, you know, this here is like a, a bespoke one-off solution between geolocate and symbiota. Wouldn't it be great if there was just, you know, some kind of network where I could just push these georeferenced annotations and they get consumed and processed and, 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 and sucked into the, to the data providers that, that provided the original data to begin with? Um, and so that's where this idea of transactional publishing comes from. And, and, and I'll admit some of this is inspired from, from blockchain, but I would argue that it is not anywhere near like blockchain, right? And, and, and you know, there's a lot, you might hear me say the word blockchain a couple of times, but I'm not referring to anything whatsoever related to, to cryptocurrency. And there is a, a, some significant um, differences. But the, the idea here is, is, is if we could represent all of our data in some form of a transaction tree that's kind of shown here on, on the right, where, you know, you have, you know, inputs and some process happens on it, whether it's a georeference or it's being loaned or being re-georeferenced again, whatever it's being happened, and then you have the output of whatever that data entity is. And so, and then being able to track all that in one, you know, in a, in a big tree of, of all these linkages as to how these things relate to one another and all these changes into different atom atomized um, entities within the data record. And then if we could take that tree and then we could represent it as a chain, as a long array of, of objects that are linked from one to the next, we could end up creating this, you know, this append only immutable and transparent data, data system. And so that's kind of where the, the the, the inspiration from blockchain comes in is this idea if we take a, a, a given data entity and we use it to generate a, a hash or another form of identifier that's based upon the, the, the entity that came before it, we can have this long chain of, of, of events or items that can ensure that the data have some form of, of immutability or if there is any, if, if there is any messing around with the data, you can check that, some, you know, that the data have not in other words, since everything's been recorded within this chain, you can't actually go back and, and make any changes to the data. Everything has to be added on onto the end. And so that gives us a, a, a strong way of data integrity. And so the idea is that we think transactions could be used to, to maintain revisions to existing data, um, annotations, whether they're at the geospatial level, temporal, physical traits, um, um, it could be used uh, to track events as in transfers of data, subsampling, imaging, sequencing, and then external linkages that are a little more separate from the specimen itself, like GenBank sequences or publications or other derived products. And so because, because of these ideas and, and a little bit of talk about this, it was decided to discuss this as a, one of the topics at the phase two consultation. And we took on the task of, of opening this up and, and trying to generate some conversation around this topic. And in total, there were um, a number of contributors that, that, uh, that contributed to, to the consultation. In total, there were about 57 entries between May and August of 2021. Um, and primarily the, the topics for discussion or the ones we were targeting were use cases, um, how can this, how can transactions be used to, to facilitate data integration and attribution? What kind of unique identifiers are necessary if we're going to be dealing with a tr transactional uh, system for publishing data? And how does this match with existing infrastructures or what new infrastructures might be needed to implement such a thing? Um, what are the kind of data storage implications for uh, changing the, the paradigm for, for publishing data, if you will. And then, you know, some issues of, you know, data rights and stewardship, particularly if we're talking about, you know, third party annotation and having pretty much anybody in the world be able to annotate a record. What are the, the implications there? And then finally, how, how would we handle sensitive data? And th there were other topics that were discussed, but these were the, the main ones that, that we were trying to, to target. And so if we look at, you know, this, just this one example of, you know, dealing with, internal data versus external data sets that have been linked in, right? So if we have a, let's say a skeletal specimen record and, and it's been georeferenced, right? And so we get a pair of coordinates and then those coordinates can then be used to let's say link in elevation data, right? We, we use some, 
you know, another service to, to look up elevation data, or maybe we'll look up other environmental parameters, rainfall, or, or there might be some modeling outputs that get attached to those georeferencing, that, that geospatial annotation. And then down the road, another geospatial annotation happens that changes that record, right? So now it's been moved to another location. And so now we have a different elevation, and now we have different rainfall parameters or whatever, and that could change the output of that particular model. And so how can all of that be linked and maintained to where we're not losing the information, right? We don't lose the fact that that there was a record that was published at one time, it had this particular coordinate, and it resulted in these particular variables. Downstream, something changed, new variables are there, and a new model can be produced, but we should not lose that linkage to that historical data set that was, that was published, that was used beforehand. And, and so being able to maintain all of that and, and how does all that happen um, is, is, a, is a tricky thing. You know, data storage is another issue and, and, and dealing with transactional mechanisms if we're kind of looking at, you know, the, 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 the chain, the blockchain example, if you will, is, you know, there's, there's two main models. And one would be that we could take the, the data content and actually embed it with the transaction tree. So you end up having, you know, every transaction has a big payload attached to it. Um, and then there's this, you know, there's this alternative method where it would be off-chain storage, where where a, the transaction and the actual payload are separate are separate from one another. So you have a transaction that describes what it is that's that's happening to this particular data entity, but the actual content of that change is actually stored off-site somewhere else. And that that's probably the most appealing one because it allows us to really, you know, it's, it, it makes it very easy to distribute the, the, the transaction tree, if you will, and make it easy to synchronize it across various systems and allow end users, whether it's a data aggregator or some power user to say, hey, I'm going to run through this, this transaction tree and I'm only interested in certain records so I can just grab the records I'm interested in or, or when I'm putting together my data portal or my aggregation system, I might only be interested in, you know, the, the tips of the the tree, if you will, that have all the, the latest um, um, records or the latest views of, of all the particular specimens. Um, talk, you know, and then we also talked a, bit, a little bit about distributed annotation. And while I think there's a lot of technical issues with how we could implement distributed annotation, most of the conversation was actually related to some of the social aspects and really as to, you know, assuming we can implement something that, that allows, you know, anybody in the world to provide an annotation to a given record, you know, who, who has the authority to, to approve or deny these records, right? Should it be the primary publishers who publish the data themselves, um, the data aggregators who are making this data available to the world, or what about the experts and the researchers who are actually working with the data, right? Um, you know, the, the, someone who's looking at the material and making measurements and, and producing the studies, um, you know, and, and where does, where do they fall in, 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 in the ability to say, yes, this is the authoritative view of this particular record. And that's important, especially when we're, if we're going to be maintaining an, an entire history of views, right? And, and, you know, when you're doing your searches, you still want that consensus accepted view for, for the vast majority of, the, of these of the fields, right? And, and maybe there's a model of community consensus that can happen, or it could be as simple as the last annotation that comes in gets accepted. There was also a little talk about using something like a WC3 annotation standard um, to enable some of the, the annotation components. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of talk of that um, within the discussion, but it was thrown out there. So that's something I think that needs further exploration to see if it's something that would be suitable and, and, and maybe either supplement a, a transactional model or, or go right inside with it, or maybe even be something that would be, um, you know, as an alternative to a transactional model, it's something to, I think that needs further investigation. Um, and then sensitive data was another topic that came up and, you know, there are systems, you know, if we had this long chain of, of data items, it would be pretty straightforward to use modern technologies, you know, cryptography to, to take any one of those entities and, and encrypt it, but that does create a lot of other technical hurdles that oftentimes is probably not worth it. If, if a record needs to be sensitive, it probably shouldn't be published. Um, because the the it just creates a, a lot more difficulties um, in, in in dealing with with uh, 
with, with the data set. So for instance, you know, only those with the key, you know, so imagine if it was encrypted, only, only those who have the particular keys, whether it's public, private key, uh, crypto, or just symmetric crypto, you know, you would, you would be required to have that, but it also makes indexing and, and making that data discoverable very difficult. Um, and so that does create a lot of overhead that, that oftentimes is not, you know, generally would be better if, if, if we didn't have to deal with that and sensitive data were just retained and, and not, not made available. Um, we did discuss a couple of infrastructures. Um, there, you know, Git, which is also kind of, you know, I, I mentioned that there's a lot of inspiration from, from blockchain, but there's also a lot of inspiration from Git, which has a lot of the same elements we want. In fact, you, we could probably implement a proof of concept using um, Git as, as a way to handle the majority of this. Git does have some, features that would make it unsuitable for what we want, but it would be, you know, it would be something that could probably use as a, you know, as, as, a, as a development platform just for getting things going and, and seeing what might, what might be possible. Um, and then, like I mentioned, you know, further exploration to the, the web annotation standard. And then finally, there was a good bit of discussion around this tool called Preston, which is a biodiversity data set tracker that's developed by uh, Yort Poland. And, you know, so this is probably the closest we have to something that's based on a transactional mechanism. Um, it does a lot of, you know, there's a lot of elements that it shares as far as hashing data sets and things like that. Um, my understanding is it's still heavily focused on the data set as opposed to individual data entities as far as highly atomized units, let's say a single change in a latitude. Um, but I do think a lot of the concepts are there and it's probably one of the, you know, the, the better platforms for, for starting to, to build some of these tools and, and, and to bring, you know, to, to get us to where we need to get. The one thing that it is missing, along with everything else, is this link to the actual primary data providers, right? And, and so that's, that's probably the biggest thing that, that has to happen for there to be, you know, for, for, for a network like this to really be realized. And that's having some kind of collection management system integration where, you know, if, if you look at the top, it's kind of how we exist right now. We have, you know, the, the collection management system, they publish out the IPT, they push out these Darwin core archives, they get aggregated indexing and search. And even right now, like tools like Preston will fit into this indexing situation where they're going, it's going out and it's harvesting stuff and it's doing its indexing and hashing and stuff. So it's, it's a very, reactive process, not a proactive, right? It has to monitor IPTs that can be published at a very, you know, it, it's up to the data providers as to when they publish. So it's not ensuring that every change is getting published. And it's also a one-way communication process, right? And, and so the idea is how can we have that develop something that's more along the lines of the lower part of the slide where we have a two-way communication thing where we have third-party annotators that can push into a network just like collection management systems can push into the network and still have aggregation indexing and search still happening and this would allow us to 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 resolve a lot of the issues and then we can also have something you know related to digital signatures when annotations are being made and it could be the same on the collection management side so you know who is publishing the the, the data sets and and um and and what's happening within the network so it gives us a lot of tracking as to who's doing what and and, and that kind of stuff and then so i'll just quickly conclude here that you know so i think the current model of data sharing, which I think is great, has gotten us, you know, where we are today. Um, but it's not sufficient to represent the full breadth of what's, you know, being thought of as as the digital extended extended specimen concepts. And so, some concept of, of publishing as transactions or as as small atomized units may pose a solution to this. And, and so the idea is, you know, every little change can just get published into the system. Um, you know, some tools currently exist, as I mentioned, the, the, the Preston tool, but it really seems that it's largely done at the data set level, the published data set level. Um, there are some socio-technical barriers to making this implementation, largely the, the CMS integration, as I mentioned that, and then, you know, some, some issues with you know, how do we handle data custodian rights and roles? And I can tell you within the, the consultation, there seemed to be a, an openness to this idea that, that collection managers or collections themselves aren't necessarily the owners of the data. And it's okay to have this, you know, other people making these opinions of data and having a different level of authority for, for records. But this was a very small group of people that are all very, you know, um, 
forward thinking towards technology, you know, for really for, you know, in, in many cases, we need to open this up and, and get feedback from many of the of the collections and, and staff and, 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 and that's where a lot of acceptance has, has to come in and get those kind of uh, 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 opinions all, all figured out and, and worked out. And then finally, you know, sp specific implementation details. I tried to avoid getting into like real nitty gritty details of how such a thing like this might work. Um, I think in the end, it's going to largely be driven by, you know, he who gets the largest grant to, to make all of this stuff happen. Um, it'll, you know, largely be, you know, driven by some project that has, has a real need and, and can, can drive the development of this and bring the community together to, to have such a, a system in place. And with that, I will, I think that was my last slide. Any questions? Thanks, Nelson. There is a spirited uh, discussion going on in the chat between Matt Yoder and Yorit Pullen. I don't know whether they want to uh, say anything about that, but there is a question in the Q&A from David Fichtmuller, who says, out of interest, what are the features of Git that made it unsuitable for the use case of the digital specimen? To me, the whole concept and its requirements feel a lot closer to Git than to blockchain. Yeah, so like I said, blockchain, I think um, what most people think of blockchain is they're thinking cryptocurrency. And, and I would agree 100%. It, it, it is way, it, what, what we need from a transactional model or for representing the digital extended specimen is much, much closer to Git. The, the elements of Git is that um, Git is not the best platform for, for storing data. And there's also an, an element of true immutability, right? So in Git, you, you know, you have a history that's there, but you can actually monkey with the history if you want. And so you could make things disappear from Git and, and there'd be no record of it. And so that is one of the things that would be, you know, that, that, so I think Git is very close. And, and, and I think, but um, yeah, I would agree that Git is much closer than, than blockchain. Yeah, Matt says that Git doesn't handle large files well at all. Now there are there are there are things that you know Git can do to 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 implement storage and and things like that. And, and you know, like I said, I think it would be a great a great platform to just start playing around and doing things. Um, and 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 we could certainly use it in, in that fashion. Um, but I, I think long term, it's going to have to be something specifically developed for our community or for data sharing and, and, and publication, which, which does create a big technical limitation, right? If, if something has to be developed from the ground up. There's a new question from Ian Engelbrecht in South Africa who says, have you looked at Terminus DB? It's sold as Git for data. I have not, no. That, it, I mean, it would have... That was not mentioned in the um, in the consultation, but you know it's it's something we can definitely look into. So one of the interesting questions that Matt Yoda asks in the chat, he says, "Has anybody studied how often data really changes in terms of the values of the data?" Because obviously there's this whole thing about, you know, the metadata can change, but the data itself is actually not changing. And whether right. anybody has studied how often the data itself really changes. Yeah, so that would probably be a good question for people that are doing some of this tracking. I, I would bet um, that um, your, it might may have the data to make that happen if he's been archiving many of these uh, of uh, these IPTs, um, he could probably look at them over time, but I don't have that data available. Okay, so we've got a few minutes left. Um, and, and so I just ask people if, if they've got any questions for, for any of the session speakers, ask them in the Q&A chat now. Uh, that was a very interesting um, presentation, Nelson. Um, I, I just want to pick up uh, again on uh, what Andy was just saying and the conversation that Matt and others were having in the chat and this, uh, this, this, this point about um, does the data really change. Uh, Matt went on to ask about whether um, the, the argument that we have to, to 
to track all changes has been properly assessed and, uh, uh, and, and, and tested. What, what's your view about the extent to which we have to track all changes? So, I mean, I think there are incidental changes that aren't necessary or things that we would not, you know, want to be publishing out to a, to a network to, to for, you know, so for example, you know, every object in our collection has a physical location where it's stored, right? And, and you know, we don't need to be publishing, oh, this was moved from room A to room B and, and things like that. So those are not the kind of changes that would need to be, be tracked. But there are, I mean, anything that, that I think is of value to, you know, is, is, is a publishable entity that can be used in, in science, right? So we're gonna publish a, a niche model that is made you know, that has a bunch of data underlying it and the underlying data can change, right? And, and we see this happening, with, you know, from a georeferencing perspective, things get georeferenced multiple times um, and they might get published once and then later on. And, and I, was, I was looking at a couple of our own records that have, have been georeferenced three or four times and, you know, they have three or four different coordinates out there. And so those are, those are you know, issues that, you know, how extensive is it? I don't know. Um, but it is it is it is one thing. But is it really just about the change, or are we also you know we want to be able to append data to it, right? So right now a lot of data that's published out there, there are a lot of skeletal records. Um, a lot of the, the the herbarium digitization projects have been grabbing skeletal records off of 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 sheets, and you know as time goes on, those records become filled out, right? And so we're appending more information onto it. And so I think it's important to say, yeah, today. The only thing we have is a verbatim locality, and that may have been parsed and used in some study, potentially erroneously or potentially correctly, however it was. But down the road, that might get broken out into the various fields and, and whatnot and, 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 and become more atomized at that point. And then you know, being able to know what the data looked like today versus what it looks like tomorrow, I think, is, is, is important. And there's no real cost to it, right? If the data aren't changing, you have a chain out there and there's nothing that gets added to it, right? So there's no real change to it. And that would be fine. Thank you. Okay, questions for any of the speakers or any other remarks that anybody wants to make? Okay, I've, I've got a question uh, for Joe, I think, if he's still around. I, I can't see him on my screen at the moment. Um, but uh, uh, we've had a, a, a good session of, of presentations by a, a number of speakers that have uh, set the scene for you know, the future of digital extended specimens and talked about uh, some of the themes uh, out of the consultation uh, and a roadmap has been uh, mentioned. Uh, Joe, what, can I put you on the spot and, and ask you how you see the development of that roadmap proceeding now? What are the next steps and the likely times go? You're muted. Yeah, I was actually looking at this event as kind of uh, a starting of that uh, endeavor. And um, I actually wrote Libby an email. I don't know if I've sent it yet. I don't know if Libby got it. But to, to uh, with her summary talk uh, in the papers that have been drafted to, you know, put together a skeletal straw dog roadmap, taking some um, uh, uh, Ex exemplar uh, roadmaps that um, uh, I've come across and, and see what um, we could put together uh, and then take that to the, the, the community to, to pour over. And um, you know, I can think of a few things that automatically go onto the roadmap, like, like the um, uh, PID, a PID roadmap, uh, and, and that would be a necessary component of the roadmap. Uh, but, and I think most people would agree with that, but some of these other components, um, uh, maybe it's up to somebody like myself, I could do that to uh, throw some ideas out there and then we muck around with them and, and see which ones of them stick and, and truly are a community uh, ideas that could go on a roadmap. But it's, said it's in the territory. Chat, let's, let's do it. <laughs> yep. Okay, good. Okay. So on time scale, uh, a symposium session this time next year on the road, on the draft roadmap, maybe. Or spinach. 
or spinach yes mm -hmm. okay <laughs> andy do you have any other points or questions uh i don't think so i think it's no. been a, a spirited discussion and i think we have um we have some a, a lot of um a lot of points to go on yeah i'd agree with that and i'd encourage everybody to look back through the chat and uh, also the question and the answers and and the speakers of course can add add answers to the questions after the session has finished yeah. uh, so so it just remains i think uh, on behalf of andy and myself uh, to say thank you to all the speakers thank you for all the to all the participants who've uh, both listened and contributed as well uh, we hope you've found it a, an enjoyable session thank you very much yep thanks everybody thank you and good thanks, night Alex and andy <laughs> you guys have a nice evening or whatever thanks. it is wherever you are thanks everybody uh, for joining mid us midnight midnight midnight, in the midnight UK. for you alex good morning yeah. good morning to one o'clock <laughs> one o'clock <laughs> okay okay goodbye all. all bye 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 everyone thanks a lot <laughs>